This is part two of the series on fMRI data analysis, looking at model-based analysis, particularly the gender linear model or GLM. So once we've pre-processed our data, how do we decide what areas are active? There's a number of different approaches we can use to analyze our fMRI data. In general, these can be broken down into two broad classes, model-based techniques that includes linear regression, which can have names such as cross-correlation or multiple linear regression or deconvolution, or nonlinear regression that is curve fitting. Or we can do model-free or data-driven approaches like principal components analysis or independent component analysis. The differences between these approaches is really what assumptions you're willing to make. The vast majority of the functional MRI data analysis methods use these model-based techniques, and in particular, the linear regression, the general linear model. And that is what I'll be covering in this lecture. So for model-based data analysis, let's say we have uh, some periods of time when we're showing a stimulus. And this is what the bold response perhaps looks like, increasing during those stimulus and de decreasing the periods after that. Model-based analysis generally follow a set of steps. That is, first, we have a signal model, what we are looking for. We fit this model to the data. And then we look for how the good this model fits with some statistics. Another thing to emphasize is that most of the analyses that we do are univariate analyses. That is, we treat each voxel time force independently. Or in other words, for each voxel, we ask, is this voxel active? Is this voxel active? And so on. This, of course, leads to multiple tests that are being performed, and we would have to correct for these multiple comparisons. So let's consider a simple regression analysis of just a task versus a control state. And let's say we have these periods when we're showing a flashing checkerboard to an individual. And this is what the bold response would look like. So how do we best model this response? Well, the simplest first would be, well, let's just model it as looking at the average of the signal when the stimulus was on compared to the average of the signal when the signal was not on. This is the same as saying this is the ideal model response, and we're going to fit that to the data. And as you can see, this doesn't fit really well. The actual response is a bit delayed. And to account for that, what we can do is we can take our stimulus timing, convolve this with a hemodynamic response function, as illustrated here, and then we take this convolved response and then we fit that to the data. And then we also get the activation amplitude, and we get some statistics for how well this fit, either t-statistic or correlation coefficient. There's a few other factors that we also have to model. So when we're looking at our signal time course, you notice that it doesn't start at zero. There's some baseline. And there may also be some other drifts and things in the data that we want to account for that are not the signal changes that we're interested in. So if we were simply to take our model response and fit that to the data, you can see it doesn't fit very well. Instead, what we have to do is we have to add other factors, like a constant and a linear drift. And then the sum of these can accurately reflect our signal. These we can call baseline parameters or nuisance regressors. And there's a number of other nuisance regressors we could use as well, such as uh, motion or physiological fluctuations, like heartbeat and respiration. These set of regressors are also sometimes called the design matrix. Looking at this from a mathematical point of view, we can write that the signal is equal to the uh, sum beta weights multiplying the uh, regressor of interest, and then uh, the regressors of no interest, the constant and the linear trend, plus some noise. We can rewrite this in a vector format, that the signal is just the uh, a matrix R times beta plus eta, where this matrix R is really just all of the different columns, all the different uh, regressors, of in, the regressors both of interest and of non-interest. Uh, and the beta is basically a vector of all the different beta weights. Now, this is a rather simple equation. And if these weren't uh, vectors and matrices, you'd think that, OK, our goal is to find beta. So we'd simply divide both sides by R. But we can't really divide by matrices. So what we can do is we can multiply by the inverse. But this matrix is not square, so it's not invertible. But what we can do is we can multiply it by pseudo inverse. So long story short, uh, mathematically, the beta can be estimated uh, through this formula here. This first term here is called the covariance matrix, uh, multiplying that. 
Uh, the T-statistic is actually like a signal to noise measure, if you will. It's the activation amplitude, the beta weight that we're interested in for that particular T-value, divided by standard deviation of that beta estimate. And the standard deviation of that beta weight is equal to the standard deviation of the noise uh, multiplied this by the square root of the covariance matrix, in particular that element of the covariance matrix corresponding to this particular uh, beta weight. Now let's consider a different kind of design, an event-related design, where you only perform the task very briefly. Uh, this is what the bold response would look like. Uh, remember, it's delayed and prolonged relative to even if you have a very brief stimulation or a task, you still have a prolonged bold response. So again, in order to analyze this, we do exactly the same steps. We take our stimulus timing. We convolve them with the hemodynamic response function. So that would look like this. And then we fit that to the data and we get some statistics of how well that fit. Now let's consider a event-related design with a varying inner stimulus interval where uh, you, the events occur more frequently as indicated here. And this is what the bold response would look like. So again, we would take this stimulus timing, we convolve this with the hemodynamic response function, and we'd fit that to the data. Same steps. Now let's consider if we have multiple conditions. So let's say we have two tasks versus a control. So note here, actually, there's three conditions going on. There's task one, task two, and whatever we decide is the control or baseline. So in this case, the way we would model this is first we would create a regressor of task one versus the control and another regressor of task two versus control. You would convolve each of these with the hemodynamic response function and then fit the sum of both of these to the data. Now often we're also interested in the differences in activation amplitude say between these two conditions. The way we would assess that is by using what are called general linear tests. The test could be set up as, do we expect these amplitudes to be the same? That'd be the null hypothesis, or are they going to be different? Or another way to rewrite that is that, is the difference between these two beta weights equal to zero or not equal to zero? Uh, and in some programs, they want you to input the particular general linear test contrast, and in this case, that will be one minus one. There's another way we could model the responses. For example, we could model what these two stimuli have in common, and another regressor expressing what these two are, how these two are different from one another. And in this case, again, uh, we would convolve each of these with the hemodynamic response function, and then fit the sum of these to the data. So the first one would fit essentially the average uh, response to both of these uh, cases, and then the second one, representing the difference, would be able to model the difference between those two uh, tasks, amplitudes. So now let's consider an event-related design with three conditions, the task A, task B, and control, uh, shown in this timing here. Again, with these, we would, this is what the bold response would look like. Again, we would take the stimulus timing or stimulus vector for each task, convolve that with the hemodynamic response function, and then we fit the sum of these to the data. So just in recap, Step one is you create the stimulus vector or, or uh, provide the task timing for each stimulus or task. You would convolve this with the hemodynamic response function in order to get your regressors and then fit these regressors to the data. Or alternatively, you simply determine what the task timing is. And then in the analysis program, such as AFNI, uh, you would simply specify what response function model you want to use. That is what hemodynamic response function. Um, and then after you would do it internally, all of the convolution creating these regressors, and then you fit those regressors to the data. So this, in a nutshell, is the basis for model-based image analysis with fMRI.